I recently decided that I wanted to replace my Xiaomi Aquara temperature and humidity sensors with something that not only has a bigger screen and more sensors, but is also more environmentally friendly, meaning that it contains a rechargeable battery instead of non-rechargeable coin cells that need to be replaced every once in a while. And I know there are rechargeable coin cells, but in a form factor this small, they will run out even faster, and since I have one in each room, I do not want to run around all the time and recharge batteries. This also means that my device needs to use the least amount of energy possible to be able to run on a single charge for a long time. I sat down designing a PCB with an ESP32 and yes there are more power efficient microcontrollers like the NIF ones, which I might consider using in a future version, but for now I will stick with something I have used in the past. For the display I'm going with the used 2.9 inch e-paper display that I got from Aaron aka ATC1441 at the Maker Fair in Hannover. Aaron also has a reference design for controlling these displays so a big shout out to him and his awesome work. The display connector and circuitry will go on the back and the display will then fold over to be on the front. That way the PCB can be the same size as the display. As for the sensors, I decided to use a few different ones, starting with the SHT31, which is the cheapest one and can measure humidity and temperature. The second one is the BME680, which is more expensive but can also measure pressure and gas resistance. However, correlating the gas resistance to any gas concentrations needs some sophisticated software. The third one is the SCD40, the most expensive one amongst those three but it can measure temperature, humidity and CO2 concentration without the need of extra software. These will be mounted on the back and are separated with a slit from the rest of the board and have no copper fill. This is to prevent any heat generated by other components to propagate to the sensors and skew their readings. To be able to save more energy, I threw in a light sensor to determine the light level of the room. This makes it possible to reduce the update rate of the display during the night or when it is hardly visible. I'm also adding a button for user inputs and an LED for user feedback. As the device needs a battery, which needs to be charged, I will also add a pretty standard TP4056 charging and D001 protection circuit with a USB-C connector. To save some space on the PCB, I decided to use 0603 components for the first time. Let's see how that goes. And off with the files to PCB way, which is the sponsor of today's video. PCBWay is your one-stop shop when it comes to prototyping, whether it be standard, advanced or flexible and rigid PCBs, CNC machining or 3D printing. They got you covered. They even provide PCB, SMD and THD assembly. Order your PCBs now using the link in the description and get $5 off of your first order. Now onto the build montage. With the PCB assembled, I need to write the software for it. Right off the bat, I want to be able to not only show data on the display, but also make it available to Home Assistant using MQTT. For sending data, the ESP32 supports a few different ways without the need of extra hardware. These are Bluetooth Low Energy, Wi-Fi, ESP Now and ESP Wi-Fi Mesh. But how to choose the right one? Since the main goal is to reduce energy consumption, we test which one uses the least of it. Since the device will be offline most of the time, I will kick ESP Wi-Fi mesh from the list because it is designed for nodes that stay connected all the time. As for the Bluetooth and ESP Now approach, some sort of gateway is needed to relay the data to the MQTT broker. For testing, I have made three different test scripts that will send some test data and then sleep. For measuring the energy consumption, I am using a power profiler kit from Nordic Semiconductor. As we can see in the graphs, despite its name, Bluetooth Low Energy uses the most energy out of the three, followed by Wi-Fi, leaving ESP now as the winner with only 17 mAh. So that is what I am going to use. While we are at it, let's also take a look at the sensors and their power consumption. 
The SHT31 consumes the least amount with about 10 MAS. The BME 680 takes 72, which is a lot more and I would have thought it would be less. After taking a deep look into the Adafruit library, I found some potential for optimization. Therefore, I made a custom version of the library, which reduces the amount of communication made with the sensor. If you are interested, you can find it on GitHub. With that, the consumption drops to only 16 MAS, which is a 78% reduction just by optimizing the code. We can do even more in hardware, but we will talk about that later. The SCD40, on the other hand, consumes by far the most energy with 830 MAS, which sadly cannot be optimized in software. This result already shows that the SCD40 is not suited for this application unless you only take a reading every hour, but then the responsiveness is also quite slow. On the other hand, we do need a gateway which is powered all the time, so it would be possible to use one of the PCBs for that and still get a CO2 reading. Now choosing between the SHT31 and BME680, I will go for the BME680, which does take a little more energy but also gives us a pressure reading. With this out of the way, let's check the total energy consumption of the device and how long it will last on a 1 amp hour battery. As you can see, the largest amount is used to update the e-paper display, which is around 142 MAS. Reading the sensors and sending the data only uses 22 MAS. In total, we are looking at 164 MAS. During deep sleep, the current is still quite high with 1.7 milliamps. If the device is sleeping for 3 minutes, it would take 306 MAS. This is 470 MAS for a cycle in total. A battery with 1 amp hour is 3.6 million MAS. Divide that by 470 MAS and we get a total of 7659.5 cycles. A cycle takes 215 seconds. Dividing that by an hour, which is 3600 seconds, gives us 16.7 cycles per hour. Now we divide the total cycles by that and get 458 hours of runtime, which is only 19 days. This is not nearly the runtime I had hoped for and this is due to some issues with the PCB itself. First of all, during deep sleep the sensors can still use up to 0.5 milliamps, even if they are powered down by software. And since they are using I2C for communication, the pull-up resistors for the bus are adding a total of 0.66 milliamps when the bus is driven low. Remember that during deep sleep the ESP GPIO pins will float, thus this is very likely. Also, the light sensor, which is basically a fancy variable voltage divider, will draw current all the time and even more the brighter it is. This can also be observed by shining a flashlight onto the sensor. By simply adding a transistor we can turn off the supply voltage to those sensors before entering deep sleep, so they can't use any energy anymore. This issue also applies to the voltage divider for measuring the battery voltage, but since I chose two 1 mega ohm resistors, the current draw with battery at 4.2 volts will only be 2.1 microamps, which is negligible. Though Maker Moko also got rid of this current in his pay-per-click project using a MOSFET resistor and capacitor. Another thing that can be optimized is adding a pull-up resistor of 10 to 100 kilo ohms to the reset line of the e-paper display. This is again due to the fact that during deep sleep the GPIOs of the ESP will float, which can wake up the display and waste power. Since the display is designed for low power applications, we don't need to turn off its power supply. This will also save us from adding an extra transistor, because if we would tie the display to the transistor of the sensors, we would waste energy while updating the display and not reading any sensor data. Other than that, we can only optimize our code to reduce the time the ESP is turned on and reduce the CPU speed. But this will have to be part of the next video when I receive the updated PCB version. To conclude, I'm very happy how this first version turned out and I'm excited to get the next one. I hope you liked this video as much as I did making it. If so, I would be happy if you like and share it, because this really helps me making more of these videos. See you next time. Bye!